Good morning. Good morning. Christ is risen. Amen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, I, I'm so happy to be able to say this. If you can't find a seat, there's some down front. <laughs> um, remember, you all, everyone has been faithful to bring donations into the hands of Mercy Food Bank. We still are doing that with non-perishable food items. Uh, Bible study will not meet this evening, will not meet this evening. Uh, the Daniel Bible study, where's Sheila hiding? There she is. Meets Tuesday at 10 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. You see that announcement. 
Uh, then on Wednesday evening, April the 7th, we'll continue our study in the Gospel of John. We're in the third chapter, and you can come in person, or you can join us via Zoom. If you want a Zoom link, just let me know, and I'll Zoom the Zoom link right out to you. That works very well. The session will meet this Tuesday at 6.30, and then on Monday, uh, Monday, excuse me, Saturday, April the 10th, there will be a session meeting, or session meeting, that's what you get. Uh, Saturday, April the 10th, there will be a, a breakfast at 8 a.m., and what I have in my mind is I have to go to a presbytery meeting over at the Beaver Creek CP Church over in Powell. Are there any other announcements that we need to make this morning? Our catechism question is, what is the fourth or which is the fourth commandment? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And you can see the scripture references uh, there with the catechism question. And right now we will pass the peace of Christ and uh, we'll do so, I guess, socially distant such as it is. And if you need to take down the tape, please do so. All right, we understand that we have that situation here. But may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Able, let's stand together and join in our call to worship as you find it uh, in the bulletin or on the screen. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. The Lord has risen. He has risen indeed. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Death has been swallowed up in victory. Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord has risen. He has risen indeed. Alleluia. Gracious God, we thank you and we praise you for who you are. We come here this morning to adore you as our risen Savior. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's remain standing for our praise chorus. It's number 65. Alleluia, alleluia. Number 367, Christ the Lord is risen today.
Let us now affirm our faith together using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I can't tell you what a blessing it is to be here this morning. Uh, it's hard to preach to empty pews. It really is. And what a joy it is to stand up here and to hear your voices lifted in praise. And what a joy and a blessing it is this morning to, to take part in the baptism of Raylan Katie Smith. Uh, Cruz and Katie came to me, I guess, what's it been, six, seven weeks ago, however long ago, and said that they wanted to baptize Raylan, and they asked if it was okay to do it on Easter. I couldn't think of a better day, because in the, in the ancient church, in the early church, that's when new believers came. They came to be baptized, and re they received a white robe, which was symbolic of the robe of righteousness, which is theirs and ours, in Jesus Christ, and she's dressed in white this morning, and please pray that she uh, behaves for us, right, ladies? <laughs> yeah, we're talking about you, sweetie. <laughs> we're talking about you right in front of you. But the question always comes up, you know, uh, why do we baptize children? You know, and, and I think we need to take the opportunity to, to look at that so that we understand it. You know, in the Old Testament, the Israelites, the Hebrews, they circumcised children, their, their sons, on the eighth day. And it marked them as belonging to the covenant, to the covenant family. And then when they were old enough, when they came of age, they received that covenant to themselves. And that's what we're talking about here. Baptism is a sign of the covenant. And Cruz and Katie are believers. They believe in the covenant of God, the covenant of grace. And as such, we are here to mark and set aside Raylan as part of that covenant. You read it in Acts chapter 2. Uh, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise, the covenant, the covenant is for you and for your children and for all those who are far, are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Children are part of the covenant. So as we baptize Raylan this morning, let's remember that and remember our own baptism, which sets us aside and marks us as belonging to Christ. Cruz and Katie, do you in presenting Raylan for holy baptism confess your faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? We do. Do you therefore accept as your duty and privilege to live before her a life that becomes the gospel, to exercise all holy care so that she will be brought up in, in the Christian faith, be taught the holy scriptures, and learn to give reverent attendance to the private 
and the public worship of God. We do. And since it is a covenant, it's to us as the congregation, to all of us. So I ask you as members of the church of Jesus Christ, do you promise to guide and nurture Raylan by word and deed, with love and with prayer, encouraging her to know and follow Christ and to be a faithful member of his church? Okay. Amen. Okay, sweetie. Raylan, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we just pray for Raylan right now, that you uphold her by your Holy Spirit, that you pour out upon her the grace of salvation, the grace of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel, a spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Lord, we thank you for this time, and we thank you for Raylan, and we thank you for her parents and her family. In your name we pray. Amen. Yeah. God bless you. You did good, sweetie. <laughs> Beth. Our next hymn is He Lives, and I think it's one of my favorite Easter hymns. Um, it's, it says it all in the title. It's and number 368, and you can remain seated. And think about the second verse and what just happened. with me and 
My mind was running forward to the last hymn when I told you to pay attention to the second verse. The second verse of the last hymn is How Sweet to Hold a Newborn Babe <laughs> and Feel the Joy and Love that uh, He or She Gives. So, anyway, that's the way my mind is working this morning. So, you better be praying for me extra hard. The noisy offering this month goes to the Young's Chapel Mission Team, the cans for the noisy offering at the, or at the rear of the church, as well as the, um, the offering plates. If you would like to leave your tithes and offerings at that uh, there, you may do so. Prayer requests and praise reports, some that have been lifted up this week, is Bob Allred, Bobby's father, with uh, he's getting some heart more tests on his heart, so remember Bobby's father. Also be in prayer for Bob Babineau. Bob uh, had a, a stroke, so a light stroke, I think, is what Paul said, be in prayer for him. Also Jordan Cooper, uh, that's y'all's grandson, is that right? He's having some medical testing done. Remember Eleanor Patterson, I'm sure many of you know Eleanor. She... Um, is recovering from heart surgery, so be in prayer for her. A word of praise for Thomas Babineau, who has been dealing with cancer and has had some chemotherapy treatments and radiation. Uh, the cancer and the tumors are shrinking, and they hope to be able to, um, to operate soon. So be in praise for that and continued prayer for Thomas. Also be in prayer for my mother. My mother goes tomorrow. She's going to, supposed to have a heart cath, and... If the blockage isn't too bad, they'll put in a stent, but it may be too bad uh, for them to put in the stent, or it's what the doctors are saying, so be in prayer for her. Also, um, remember Rick and Pam Willis, their husband and wife, who both have cancer, and I think Pam's diagnosis is a little more uh, severe, a little more dire than Rick's, and they are friends or, and neighbors of Kate and Sean who live in Florida. Are there any other prayer requests or praise reports we need to lift up this morning? Bill, um, a friend that we have in, in the South Division, her niece, uh, they have a little boy, three years old, and he walked out in the backyard and fell in the pool and drowned. Oh, goodness. So, uh, we want to remember them. I don't know their name, but Sandy is a good friend of ours. And that just That's sad. Jean? Crystal Williams is in the hospital at Ridge, and Crystal is very ill. She is Billy Watts' granddaughter. Anyone else? If I don't see you, just speak up, Jamie. <laughs> I just want to thank everybody for the prayers for my dad. Um, he's doing better. Had his surgery a couple of weeks ago and has gotten good results back so far. So thank you for that. Um, I also want to remember the family of Jeremy Puckett. Uh, he died this week of cancer, leaving behind two high school age boys. I don't know arrangements. They said that they would be doing something within the next week or so. Yeah, be in prayer for that family. I think Jeremy was what, 40, 41 years old? What, 44. Let's be in prayer for them. Anyone else? Joe? Uh, Granny Sieber had a. Oh, Granny Sieber. Her, her uh, surgery was successful. Double bypass. So that's a praise. Thank you, Joe. Anyone else? Jennifer. Um, Leanne Gaddis, G A D D I S. She's a teacher at Ter was a teacher at Cherokee. Um, she has ovarian cancer and has had surgery and is going through treatments. But I know a lot of the kids here know her. She has a great attitude about it, and it seems like she's doing phenomenal, but I know she would have 
anyone else. I can't let this opportunity go by without saying something. I just praise God that uh, my son and Brian and my daughter-in-law, Becky, and those two gentlemen sitting there with him, Trey and Maddie, and I just thank God for them and thank God for being able to walk up these stairs and come into this door and see all of my brothers and sisters I was glad when they said to me, let us come to the house of the Lord. Savior, we have no fear of what's going on around us because we live with a sovereign God that takes care of us and strengthens us and comforts us. And his witness. Amen. Every minute of every hour of every day, no matter what's going on. And I just thank God we don't have to face any fear at all. Amen. Thank I you. <laughs> Preach it, Brother Ron. <laughs> uh, Brother Dale, uh, Tim Bolden. Bolden. Yes, sir. And uh, Gene Pierce, he's going through radiation and chemo right now. Just lift those guys up. Anyone else? Well, let us pause now for a moment of prayer. Glory to you, O oh God. We come to you this morning and we give you thanks. Father, on this day we remember that you won the victory over death, that Christ rose from the grave and he gives us eternal life. So, Father, we give you the glory and the honor and praise that through his life, death, and resurrection, you won for us salvation. You overcame death, and you opened the gate to everlasting life. So we praise you, Father. Almighty God, in raising Christ from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and of death. And Lord, we come and we confess to you that, that we sometimes do indeed live in doubt and in fear. We, we fall in the face of our sin and and Father, we just come before you and we confess our sins to you just now. The times that we overlooked uh, an opportunity to tell someone of you. The times, Father, when we were angry and spoke out of turn, Father. The times that we, we were um, selfish, gossipy, prideful, mean-spirited. Father, we, we confess those sins to you, and as we do so, we confess in, in the sure knowledge and the full assurance that you do indeed forgive us of our sins because of the life, death, and resurrection of your Son, that he has taken our place. So, Father, we give these sins to you in and and the full knowledge that you cleanse us, that you forgive us through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we come in the knowledge of that forgiveness and we lift up all of these prayer requests to you this morning. People who uh, we praise you, Father, for healing that's going on through the different treatments. Father, and we just give you praise for that and continued healing. And Lord, we pray for those that are in the midst of uh, treatments for cancer. Father, we just pray for healing there as well as only you can give. And Lord... Uh, we especially lift up uh, this family who has lost a, a young child through, through a terrible, terrible accident, Father. And we just pray your comfort upon them and your grace in their lives. And now, Father, we, we come before you as the body of Christ. And, and we just ask that, um, that your love would fill each one of us. That we would live each day of our lives in the presence and in the power of your resurrection. Lord, continue to grant us the knowledge that you are indeed sovereign, 
that you are indeed in control, even when we think that things are coming apart all around us. Father, you are there with us. Lord, help us to live for you. Help us to be pure and blameless until the day of your son's return. And Lord, we close this prayer with the prayer that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Heaven's gates are open wide. He 
the gospel. That's the gospel in that song. Scripture this morning comes from 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 39. Uh, had to put a little smaller font up there. If you can see it on the on the screen, that's great, or if you want to, you can use the Bible that's in the pew in front of you. I think it's on page 1143, or you can use your electronic device like so many people do today, and we're going to be there in 1 Corinthians, and the, the, the people who live there in the city of Corinth uh, that Paul is writing to in the first century, in many ways, they weren't a whole lot different than we are here in the 21st century. There were people in Corinth, like some of us today, some people today, they were teaching that there was no such thing as a resurrection. For them, the idea of a resurrection was a, an April Fool's joke. That's how they felt about it. Paul quotes them in the 12th verse of chapter 15. Some of you are saying... There is no resurrection from the dead. And then, beginning in verse 35, Paul anticipates, I guess, a snarky response from them, a, a cynical response from them. Uh, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? And that's, that's really not an honest question on their part. It's an attempt to highlight what the Corinthians felt was just absurd, the absurdity in Paul's teaching. It's like, oh, sure, Paul, yeah, right, a resurrection, give me a break. You know, you say there's a resurrection, you're so convinced of it, uh, just what will it look like? What will this body look like? You're being ridiculous, Paul, and, and that's their point of view. That is their perspective. And Paul, in verse 36, he, uh, he doesn't pull any punches. He turns the tables on him and he says, you foolish person. He says... You see, when you embrace the philosophy of the age and you bow down to it instead of bowing down before the truth of the word of God, you embrace foolishness, Paul says. Then he sets out to correct their thinking, and he does so with three themes, and it's these three themes I hope to use as we look at this passage. Verses 36 through 41, the theme of resurrection and creation. Then 42 through 44, the theme of resurrection and transformation. Then 45 through 49, resurrection and redemption. Let's read 1 Corinthians 15 together. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, but what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, but it is raised a spiritual body. 
If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit anew to us just now, that the word of God might take hold of our hearts, Father, change our lives, Lord, that we might be united to you in the fullness of the resurrection life. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You know, as we look at the television and get our news from there, you may get it from your phone or email or read the papers, whatever. Every group is fighting these days to have their personal perspective heard. You know, we hear that black lives matter, and then we hear another group yell that white lives matter, and then, some, then there's another group that tries to be more inclusive, and they say that all lives matter. Then there's the LGBTQ plus a revolution that has swept across this country in less than a decade. And I think right now it's the T in that array of letters that seems to matter the most. Anyway, you add to all of that uh, critical race theory and then the so-called peaceful protest. And then you take all of that and you put it in a pot and you throw in a pandemic you throw in a healthy dose of COVID-19 and the world that we knew just a little over a year ago seems to have vanished, doesn't it? Everything's been turned on its head. And I think about stuff like that sometimes. I guess it's crazy. I don't know if you think about it. How did we get here? Where did all these crazy ideas come from? And as I was thinking about it, I remembered a book that I read over 20 years ago by a fellow named Chuck Colson. Everybody remember Chuck Colson from Watergate fame, went to prison and then started a, a prison ministry. He wrote a book that's entitled, How Now Shall We Live? And one of the chapters in that book is entitled, Darwin's Dangerous Idea. And he points out that Darwinism, i.e. The, the theory of evolution, what it does is it eliminates the transcendent. That's a fancy way of saying that it does away with God. And postmodern ideas, that's the, the age that we're living in, that does away with absolute truth. In other words, nothing is absolutely true. There is no transcendent truth. And then Coulson points out that if there's no God and if there's no absolute truth, then there's no meaning to life. There's no purpose in life. All we are left with is ourselves, right? So where do we come up with our, our ideas, ideals? Where do we come up with our ethics? And Coulson answers the question this way by saying, there's only, what you're left with, there's only, and this is 20-something years ago, there's only the black perspective, the feminist perspective, and the Hispanic perspective, and on it goes. And that's exactly where we are. He was, it was just prophetic to me as I read that. I'd forgotten he had gotten that specific and he points out that the natural conclusion to all of this is hopelessness. You stop and think about it. If there's no God, then why are we here? And how did we get here? And what does life mean? I mean, what will become of what I am doing today and what happens to what I'll do tomorrow? Why should I live? Why should I wish for anything or do anything? If all I am, if all I do is carry DNA and pass it on to somebody else and then I die... What difference does it make? What do I have to look forward to? What's the point? And that's what we're taught at every turn. On that first Easter morning, when the stone was rolled away and Christ stepped out alive from the grave, I think all of these fearful questions were answered very decisively. Because Jesus Christ died and is alive forevermore, death is not the end. Death is not final. And because of that, life has purpose. Life has meaning. 
because Jesus lives, death no longer has the victory. See, remember, Paul is dealing with skeptics there in Corinth, skeptics who doubt the very concept of resurrection. And you look at verses 36 through 41. Just look there with me, up either on the screen or in your Bible. And Paul begins his defense of the resurrection by first pointing to the creation. Resurrection and creation. You foolish person, verse 36. What, sow, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a kernel. Perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen. And each to, and to each kind of seed its own body. The idea of a resurrection in Paul's mind is not ridiculous at all. In fact, we deal with resurrection all the time, he says. When the farmer sows his seed, he buries it in the ground. And then when the crop grows, it sprouts up, it's arisen. You bury it, and it's dead, it looks dead, and then something new arises. In other words, Paul is saying, the resurrection is all around us. Paul is saying, in every field and in every garden, it's around us. It's a picture of the resurrection of the believers. And Paul isn't making this up on his own. He's not pulling it out of thin air. He's actually quoting Christ. It's built on what Christ said in John's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 23, where Jesus says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus is the seed that dies and rises and bears much fruit. All of you are evidence of that this morning. Fruit from the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Paul is telling the Corinthians, and he's telling us, that Jesus' death and resurrection is a foreshadowing of the promise, a foreshadowing of the reality of our own resurrection. If we, by grace through faith, have trusted in Christ, then we, like him, we shall die, and then like him, we shall rise again and enter into the glory of his resurrection. You see, Easter is simply a window through which the Christian can see their ultimate destiny. And sometimes that's hard to see, isn't it? When life gets hard, you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you something you really don't want to hear. You don't want to hear cancer. You don't want to hear surgery. You don't want to hear heart problems. You don't want to hear any of that. Or there's a family member who's just, or a friend, and they just hurt you. And the hurt's too much to bear. And, and the hurts and the wounds and the loneliness of all of this, it just cuts you to the heart. It cuts you down to the bone. And you get worn out and you get weary of it all. And in these moments, it can be hard to imagine that anything is going to get better in this world. Why is this happening? What is going on? And the skepticism that the Corinthians were talking about, it can become uh, real to us in those moments, can it? And let me tell you something. When it crowds in and it tries to overwhelm you, that's when you need to know your Bible. That's when you need to turn to 1 Corinthians 15 and remember the truth and the promise of this passage. The truth and the promise of of this of your glorious destiny one day your the seed of our lives will be sown one day we will be buried and one day the seed of our lives will rise again and bear much fruit now why because that's the promise that our lord and savior gave to us in the pages of scripture christ was buried christ died christ rose again and because of that there's hope and it's not like, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. Hope in the scripture is a sure and steadfast thing. It is a rock-solid promise. It's not the hope that we talk about in this life. In the scripture, it is a hope, an assurance. And it, the, the gloom and the sorrow and the sadness of our lives will be overcome by the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. There is hope only because of the empty tomb. There's hope only because Christ is risen. 
And because he is risen indeed, the sting of death is gone, and he has won the victory. Now verses 39 through 41. You see there Paul listing the various orders of the created world. You see there verses 39 and 40, 41. Not all flesh is the same. There is, there are humans have one kind, animals another, birds another, fish. They're all different. Even the heavenly bodies and the earthly bodies are different. The sun and the moon and the stars, they differ from one another in glory. And I think the point he's making this time is that each of God's creatures has been fitted perfectly for its environment by its creator. Remember the Corinthians were asking, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? And Paul is answering, he's saying, it's just like creation. It's like the creation you see all around us right now. So in the resurrection that awaits us, God will prepare for us a body that will perfectly fit that new environment. Something interesting I thought to notice here is the order that Paul mentions things in. Uh, first humans, then animals, birds, fish, sun, moon, stars. If you look in Genesis, that's the exact reverse order of the creation that you find there in Genesis 1. And the point, I think, is this. When the resurrection comes, when Jesus Christ returns at the last day, we're going to get more than an upgrade. It's more than just, you know, you, get, you go to your computer and, oh, Windows is updating, and you go, oh, gosh, you know, and it's more than that. It's more than a lick of paint on, on an old house. It will be an entire renovation of your life. It will be a thorough transformation of all things. Nothing. Nothing will be left unchanged on that great day. And if you want to read more about it, turn to Romans 8. And we won't go into Romans 8 right now, but that's your Easter Sunday afternoon homework as you nod off on your Sunday afternoon nap, right? But... Romans 8, we'll get to that. And then all of this brings us to the second theme. Not just resurrection and creation, but resurrection and transformation. Verses 42 through 44. Just as each of God's creatures has a glory that fits an environment, its environment, we also will be made suitable for the new creation. What is sown imperishable, what is raised, or what is sown perishable, what is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. Look at the adjectives there. The seed of this life, he says, is sown perishable in dishonor, in weakness, and a natural body. That's a pretty, dis it's a pretty good description of my life, isn't it? I mean, can you relate to it? Weakness, dishonor, perishable, our bodies age, they get sick, a body that's fragile, a body that becomes the focus of temptation, a body that becomes the instrument of sin, a natural body. Can you relate to that? That's me and that's you. But Paul says that when the Lord returns, when the trumpet sounds, the perishable seed will be raised how? Imperishable. We will receive bodies, guess what, that will not break down. They will not age, they will not hurt, and they will not die. Bodies sown in dishonor will be raised in glory on that day. Ever since Adam and Eve hid themselves in the garden after eating that forbidden fruit, uh, and because they were afraid, what did they do? They hid themselves. They were naked and ashamed, and they hid themselves. And, and they, in the shame and dishonor of their body. And as we've been looking and uh, studying 1 John over the past, I guess, couple of three months, we read there in 1 John 3, what shall we be, what we shall be has not yet appeared, but we know we shall be like him, for we shall, shall see him as he is. In other words, there's a day coming when we'll no longer regard ourselves with shame and dishonor. We will be transformed. We will be made into the likeness of Christ and his glory and his resurrection body. We will be raised in glory. Our bodies here, Paul says, are sown in weakness. On that day, they're raised in power. And that's the inexhaustible power of the risen Christ, the power of an indestructible life, the power that he, he'll take that and he'll empower us and our natural bodies will be raised spiritual bodies there will be a great transformation. You know, I think about this. It's a new clothing, a new body for that new order. You think about 
uh, you know, when astronauts go into space, they have to wear a special suit to survive in that, in that environment, in the vacuum of space. And I think, uh, in other words, they've got to meet a dress code of sorts, I guess, to get in there in space. And I think that's something like what Paul is saying. And we can see it more plainly if you glance down to verse 53 where Paul says that this perishable body must put on the imperishable. And this mortal body must put on immortality. When Jesus returns, this creation is going to be made new. That's what he's saying. Paul says that if we're to live in that new world, we must be clothed no longer with mortality, but with immortality. We have to meet the dress code. A great change, a transformation will take place in us. When Paul says this, he's using the Corinthians' argument against them. He takes their argument and he turns it around on them. They're saying flesh and blood can inherit the kingdom, Paul. Bodies, uh, these bodies, the material world, surely they're not going to survive in the age to come. Doesn't that make resurrection ridiculous, Paul? And Paul says, you know what, you're right. You're absolutely right. Flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom. Mortal bodies will not survive. But you're wrong in assuming that resurrection means resuscitation of this physical body, a resuscitation of the dead. That's not, you know, we're not talking about an episode of The Walking Dead. We're not talking about a zombie apocalypse when Christ returns. No, we're talking about a full transformation, a radical transformation of our bodies from flesh and blood to something else, from mortal to immortal, from perishable to imperishable, a great change. And then we will be fit for the new creation. And that leads to the question, well, where do I get this transformation, right? How do I get in on this? Where does it come from? That brings us to resurrection and redemption, resurrection and redemption. If I'm going to need a space suit for the new creation, if I'm going to need to make, uh, meet a dress code, where do I get it? What about transformation? I know I need transformation. Paul talks about transformation, and he does so by drawing a parallel between the first Adam in Genesis and the second Adam, Jesus Christ. And in these verses, 45 through 49, Paul refers to Jesus as the last Adam or the second Adam. He talks about the man of dust. The man of dust is Adam. The man of heaven is Jesus. And there's this parallelism going on. And thus it is written, you get, you'll see it here as we read it. Thus it is written, the first Adam became a living being. That's Genesis 1, Adam. The last Adam, Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have, been bor have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. So you see that parallel. Two Adams, first Adam in Genesis, made by God, uh, spoken into being, made of the dust of ground, the man of dust. And then there's another Adam. The last Adam, the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, who unlike the first Adam, what did he do? He was not created. He is the creator. And he enters into his creation, and he lives a, a perfect life, dies, and is risen from the grave. So it's a new humanity, a new start. He is heavenly. And there are those and all of those who are united to him by grace through faith will rise with him in glory. And there are those who are united to the first Adam who are merely earthly and they have no hope of glory. And then there are others who are united to the last Adam. And the point is this, if you are in Christ, now in this life, you bear the image of the first Adam. We still bear that image right now. But one day, you will bear the image of the second Adam, of the last Adam. You will bear the image of the man of heaven. One day you will be transformed. You will be like Christ in resurrection glory. So Easter, as I said earlier, is a window to your destiny. Jesus rose from the dead. Everybody who lives and believes in him shall rise also. The only way to have the space suit, the only way to have the proper garments, 
to meet the demands of the dress code is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus and Jesus only, in him only is there a hope of glory. In Jesus and only in Jesus is there assurance of this transformation, the assurance of a new body. The great question then becomes, for you and for me, are you in Jesus or are you still in the first Adam, the man of the earth who will not see the glory to come? Let me say this in another way and we're done, okay? I promise. You may not know it, but the scriptures, in the scriptures, there are two births and two deaths. Two births and two deaths. There's a natural birth. We've all experienced that physical birth. But then you remember Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus in the Gospel of John in the third chapter. And he talks about another birth. A second birth. He says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born from above. That is to say, new life has to break in upon you. New life has to come to you right now. Resurrection life must become yours right here and right now. Two births. The natural birth and being born again. But there are two deaths. There's a natural death. At the end of our lives, we'll all face that natural death. But there's another death. John talks about it in Revelation chapter 21, and he calls it the second death, the lake of fire. It's what we call hell. It's the place of final and eternal judgment. And so now here's the issue that we need to walk away from, from, with, from 1 Corinthians 15. Here's the issue that we all have to wrestle with. Those who have only been born once, you're destined to die twice. Those who have been born twice will only die once. Those who have been born once will die twice. Born twice, you only die once. In other words, unless you're born again, unless you're born from above, unless the resurrection life of Jesus Christ erupts in your heart and envelops your heart here and now, changing forever, you forever, unless you trust in Christ and Christ alone, you will die a natural death only to face the second death, the eternal death under the wrath and the curse of Almighty God. If, you're, if you are born only once, you will die twice. That's what the scriptures tell us. But if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who died and rose from the grave on that first Easter, if you'll trust in him, if, you'll put, if, you, if the one who called himself, Jesus called himself the resurrection and the life, he said, though you die, yet you, shall you live, and if you live and believe in me, you will never die. That's what Jesus said. One day, he says, you'll be raised up and given a glorious body, a resurrection body. On that day, you will bear the image of the man of heaven. So let me ask you, are you in the first Adam? A man of dust, a woman of dust, born only once and doomed to die twice? Is that your situation? Is that where you are on this Easter Sunday? Are you in the last Adam? Are you in the man of heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the only Savior of sinners, born twice, destined to die once, and then to live in resurrection life with Christ forever and ever? Is that your destiny? That's the demand that the first Easter places upon everyone. Born twice, and so you die once, and you live in the glory and in the presence of God forever and ever through faith in Christ. Is that you? Or will you remain an Adam, a man of the earth, the man of dust, born once, doomed to die twice? Where to one are you? May the Lord be gracious to all of us, May the Lord enable each of us this Easter Sunday to cling to the Lord Jesus and his resurrection life, that by believing in him, we may never die. Let us pray. Our Father, we pray for one another. We ask that you help each of us to fix our eyes on Jesus, not the Christ on the cross or the Christ in the tomb, but the Christ, but the Christ who died was buried and rose again on the third day, the Christ who is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he will come to judge the living and the dead. Fix our eyes upon him. 
Draw each one of us, Father. Draw all of us to him, to bend our knee to him, to bow before him, to claim him, that second Adam, that last Adam, claim him as our only rescue, that resurrection life, not death, might be ours. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Gracious God, we thank you that you are a living Savior, that you walk with us, that you speak with us in every aspect of life, that you indeed are sovereign, that you, we can face the days of uncertainty that are before us in the full assurance of your grace and your mercy. And now may the grace of God, the love, communion, and fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with each one now and forevermore. Amen.